The scripture this morning is from Psalm 11. It's a short scripture, but I'd ask you to pay attention to the psalmist uh, posing a question to which he already has the answer. Hear the word of the Lord. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let's pray. Gracious Father, this morning we pray that these words would come to life. We pray that your spirit would be our teacher. We pray that your word would come to life in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which nature's laws and the God of nature entitles them. It is time that they respect the opinions of mankind, that they should state and declare the reasons for their separation. And they said this, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are established among men, deriving their just powers from the governed. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted, and that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such forms so that they may, seem, they may seem most likely to affect their safety and their happiness. The Declaration of Independence went on and in great detail itemizes the causes for the separation. And they concluded with these words, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, appealing to the supreme judge of the world, do solemnly publish and declare that these United States are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. 56 representatives of the 13 original colonies unanimously agreed to the Declaration of the United States of America and they affixed their signatures. The Articles of Confederation and the Constitution of the United States of America followed. In total, the number of founding fathers who signed these original documents was 204. Among the 204 were 88 Episcopalians, 30 Presbyterians, 27 Congregationalists, 7 Quakers, 6 Dutch and German Reformed, 5 Lutherans, 3 Catholics, 3 Huguenots, 2 Methodists, and 1 Calvinist. They proclaim such principles as unalienable rights. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their Creator. They spoke of freedom and independence. They proclaimed their belief in the ultimate source of life and of these unalienable rights as nature's God, the creator, the supreme judge of the world. And they depended upon his divine providence and protection. Founding fathers and signers of these original documents publicly testified of their Christian faith by their membership in Christian churches. These men wanted freedom. They wanted liberty. 
They wanted to be personally free to pursue their dreams and to ensure freedom for their families and for those for whom they were responsible. They wanted to have freedom to worship according to their faith and not be subjected to the tyranny of a government that would limit their worship or worse, define their worship for them. They wanted to build a nation with standards of morals and ethics taught in the Holy Scriptures, and they wanted them taught in their children's schools so that they would learn about their duties to God and their duties to their fellow man. They would fight to the death for that kind of freedom and liberty. And many did fight to the death for that vision of a new nation. We remembered three days ago our Independence Day. Ever since Patrick Henry made his patriotic call for liberty and death, Americans have cherished liberty and freedom. We look back 230 years to a time when men whose faith was in the creator God of the universe stood fast and fought for a foundation of freedom which was based on the holiness and the righteousness of a triune God. At the core of that foundation was a Christian worldview, make no mistake about it. At the core was the recognition of a creator God who was involved in his, in, in his creation and who had a desire to have an intimate relationship with those whom he created in his own image. Our forefathers knew that unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. These men believed God's word when he said, he will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Was everyone a Christian? Probably not. But our founding fathers established principles and practices defined by a faith founded in the character of our holy God. At the heart of those principles, at the core of the identity of this newborn United States of America, was the beating heart of a way of life defined by the holiness and righteousness of our triune God. Since history began, no nation has established a foundation for freedom like the United States of America. No nation has globally championed freedom as the United States has done in its first 200 years. But what happens if those foundations are destroyed? Dr. John Gill was a biblical scholar and theologian even before the Revolutionary War, and he penned a succinct answer to this question when he said these words, If the foundations be destroyed, all things are out of order and course, both in church and state. The laws which are the foundations of government are despised and disregarded. Judgment is perverted, and justice stands afar off. The doctrines and principles of religion are derided and subverted so that there is no standing either in a political or religious sense. All things out of order. Foundations of government disregarded. Judgment perverted. Justice afar off. What if all that we know to be good and pure and wholesome and healthy and democratic about this republic we call the United States of America were to go away? What if the foundations established over 200 years ago were to erode to the extent that the basic rights and freedoms we so readily enjoy and too often take for granted collapse from the onslaught of legislated tolerance and inclusion? What if our national bent toward compromise and policies of appeasement so dilute our founding principles that the very freedom and liberties and morals and ethics so vital to sustain our way of life were to gradually disappear? Can you imagine that? It's not something that we think about often, but we're thinking about it more and more. Because at their core, our foundations are in jeopardy. The beating heart of a way of life once defined by the holiness of God is slowing and weakening. Pastor and teacher John MacArthur has noted that in less than 50 years' time, 
Our nation's political leaders, legislative bodies, and courts have adopted a distinctly anti-Christian attitude and agenda. The country has swept away the Christian worldview in the name of equal rights, political correctness, tolerance, and strict separation of church and state. Gross sexual immorality, abortion, pornography, and other evils have been sanctioned not only by society in general, but in effect by the government as well. Many think that this is a political problem that requires political solutions. They are wrong. This is a spiritual problem, and we can turn to God's word to find the answer to the question that the psalmist asks. If these foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? What scripture provides is not a political strategy for electing more conservative representatives and senators. What scripture provides is not a blueprint for running a presidential campaign. The scripture does provide us with timeless instructions and truths that we as the body of Christ, the body of believers across the face of this planet are to embrace in every generation, in every culture, and in every nation that we find ourselves. What are the righteous to do in the face of crumbling foundations? Scripture poses the question and scripture gives us the answers. First, know that the only sure foundation is Jesus Christ. Hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah the prophet spoke these words from his Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, of a sure foundation. That sure foundation is Jesus Christ. And those who are in Christ, those who have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The foundation of any nation, including these United States of America, are sure to one day crumble unless they are embedded in the rock, the tested stone, the precious cornerstone, the upholding power and sustaining power of Christ Jesus. He is the only sure foundation. To the extent that the foundations of a nation are rooted and grounded in the rock of salvation, and affixed and aligned with the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is held together, they will stand. When the foundation becomes something that is not forever lasting, something other than the triune God of the universe, it will begin to crumble and crush under the weight of sin that it accommodates and promotes. The nation will literally die from the cancer of sin within. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, your foundation is sure because Jesus Christ is the sure foundation. Second, your real citizenship is in heaven. As Christians, we have a dual citizenship, don't we? Yes, we are Americans. We are citizens of this great United States of America, and we are blessed to be so. But as much as we may love this country, as much as we care about the foundations of this great nation, as much as we love the history and traditions and culture and freedom and liberty that it affords us, our citizenship is in heaven. We just read in Ephesians that we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. From Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, he says this, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. We are citizens of heaven where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. All the presidents of the world, all the princes and prime ministers, all the monarchs and ayatollahs, all the tribal leaders and chieftains are subject 
to the sovereign creator God of the universe. Christ reigns. He subjects all things to himself. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. And he alone is worthy of our praise. To him is due all honor and all glory and all dominion forever and forever. He stated the transcendent truth when he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And if you know Christ is your savior, then you know that your world has no end and the kingdom has no end. Third, there are responsibilities that come with your citizenship. Your king has work for you to do. Scripture says that it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the bonds of slavery. As citizens of heaven, we are to stand firm. We're to stand in the freedom that was purchased not by a revolution 230 years ago, but by Christ on the cross over 2,000 years ago. Regardless of the future of this once great nation, our citizenship is in heaven, and we serve the sovereign. We're to stand firm in that freedom, and we're to resist the onslaught of sin. But the scripture also says that as citizens of heaven living on this earth, that we are ambassadors of Christ. We really need to understand what that means. It's a very noble word, isn't it? Ambassador. It's a title given to someone who represents a king or a government. Virtually every government on earth sends their ambassadors as representatives to other countries. To scorn or mistreat an ambassador would be to scorn or mistreat the government that sent him there. To break communication, to separate from an ambassador, would be to separate from the king or the monarch that he represents. If you're an ambassador, you wind up in an alien culture where there's a foreign environment, different traditions, different perceptions, different ways of seeing things. If your comfort level with this country and this culture is diminishing, it's because this culture's foundations are eroding. But we are to stand firm. Think of it. As citizens of heaven sojourning and living on this earth, we're to stand firm as ambassadors of Christ. But our responsibility here is not to change the culture. Our responsibility here as Christ's ambassadors is not to change the culture. An ambassador goes to a foreign land to represent the sovereign that sent him there. We're to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To his ambassadors, Christ said these words, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. Jesus does not tell us to go and change the culture. He doesn't require us to debate social issues and demand political change. He does tell us, as his ambassadors, to go and tell the world about the work of Christ on the cross to redeem a fallen world through grace and forgiveness. Christ did not come to promote some new social agenda or new moral order. He did come to establish a new spiritual order of men and women born into new life. He did not come to earth to make old creation moral through social and governmental reforms. He did come to make new creatures holy through the saving power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's so easy to get caught up in the issues of the day, the moral issues, the political issues, the economic and human rights issues. And even though they might be good and important things, the danger is that we become hostile toward the people who disagree with us. The mission field becomes our enemy. Those we would introduce to Jesus Christ become our adversaries. Our responsibility is not to change the culture, 
changed people, changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and the freedom of grace and forgiveness changed the culture. Now let me be clear. I'm not saying that as Christians we are not to defend Christian morals and ethics. The Bible says that we are always to be prepared to give a defense of the hope that we have. I'm not saying that we are not to engage and debate those who promote ungodliness. The Bible says that we are to glare, to glare these things, that we are to exhort and rebuke with all authority. But as his ambassadors, we must do it as Scripture teaches, with gentleness and respect. We must speak the truth in love. We must not alienate those who need Jesus Christ and don't even know it. We still live in a nation of freedom and liberty, and as long as that is the case, we are to be good citizens and participate in the political process. We have responsibilities in our dual citizenship as well. We are to champion causes that align with our Christian faith. We are to do everything we can to preserve and protect the sanctity of life, the holiness of marriage between a man and a woman, and the preservation of laws that find their life in the perfect character of a holy God. We are not to sit in silence when we have the freedoms to speak out against injustice, immorality, corruption, and oppressive government. We must speak out and take on those who would, through deceit and disguise, destroy the foundations on which this great nation was founded. But when the foundations crumble, what are the righteous to do? The righteous are to do that which they should be doing while the foundations are standing. The righteous are to stand firm in the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the only firm foundation. The righteous are to be good citizens of Christ's kingdom and live a life worthy of your calling. We are to take our responsibilities as ambassadors of Christ seriously. And above all, we are to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's one more thing to note before we close. Scripture says that we are indeed citizens of heaven, ambassadors for Christ. But notice this. God making his appeal through us. Is that amazing? The holy, triune, creator God of the universe picks the likes of us to make his appeal to the men and women of this world who need him so desperately. What an awesome responsibility we have as ambassadors of Christ. We are ambassadors of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and we have a message of reconciliation from the Creator God of the universe. He is making His appeal through us. And the message that we have is the message of the cross. And the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being saved, but it is the power to salvation. This nation needs men and women freed from their sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. People changed this way will change our culture and the world. People changed this way will hold fast to the foundations embedded in the cornerstone, the tested stone, the rock of our salvation, the only sure foundation, Jesus Christ. May God bless America through his church and through the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, the only sure foundation is your son, Jesus Christ. The only message that's so vital for this world and for the people that need you so desperately is the message of the cross. Father, Enable us, empower us as citizens of heaven to be your ambassadors here on earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.